Ancient biography did not aim for modern precision. If you were going to write a book today about an important person, what genre would you use? Horror fiction, poetry, or biography? And if you were a biographer in the first century, writing for readers living in the first century, about a person who had lived in the first century, would you use the literary conventions in play in the first century, or those that did not come into play until more than 1,500 years later? The answers to these questions are obvious. So what were the literary conventions for writing ancient biography? Well, to answer, I'll begin by asking how many of you are married? Lots of you, okay. Then many of you know exactly what I mean when I say there's a guy version of the story and a girl version. <laughs> now, of course, I'm generalizing here, but for the most part, women like details and lots of them. They'll tell you what happened, where it happened, when it happened, why it happened, how it happened, who was there, what they were doing, what they were wearing, what they were saying, what they were thinking, and how they were feeling. <laughs> Guys are different. We like bullet points. Get to the bottom line. The game's coming on in five minutes. When we're talking to another guy on the phone, we'll often omit details we think are unimportant. We'll even alter a few minor details a little in order to avoid having to give five minutes of background knowledge for which the other guy couldn't care less. You know what I'm talking about, right? Most of us guys have had the experience of describing an event on the phone to a friend when our wives who have been listening in the background say, you know, it didn't happen that way. You forgot to mention this and that, and he didn't say it at that time, he said it at this time, and he said it this way, and we're thinking, oh, we're not trying to deceive. Guys report relevant facts. Women report, <laughs> women report everything, and they insist on doing so with the precision of a legal transcript. It's not a matter of the right and wrong way of telling the story. It's a matter of having different objectives. Flexibility. Well, ancient biographers sometimes give us the guy version of a story, and sometimes they give us the girl version. I'll give you two examples from the Gospels. Number one, Jesus heals a centurion's servant. Luke gives us the girl version. Luke tells us that there was a centurion who had a servant who was sick. He wanted Jesus to, he to ask Jesus to heal him, but for some reason he was afraid to go see, that, uh, see Jesus. So he sent some Jewish elders on his behalf to make the request. They came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, there's a centurion and he's kind to us. He's got this servant who's sick, please come heal him. And Jesus says, all right, let's go check it out. And so they head toward the centurion's house. The centurion gets word of this, and so he sends some friends to intercept Jesus. They come to the, Jesus and they say, Jesus, the centurion says that he's unworthy for you to enter his house, but he knows you have authority, so just give the command and his servant will be healed. And Jesus praises the faith of the centurion and heals his servant without ever seeing the centurion. That's Luke's version. He gives us the girl version. Matthew gives us the guy version. Matthew streamlines, he simplifies the story. For him, let's just cut out these emissaries. They were just delivering his message, so he airbrushes them out of the story and has the centurion himself go to Jesus to make the request in person. He streamlines, he simplifies. Flexibility. Here's another example. Jesus curses a fig tree. Mark gives us the girl version. For Mark, he tells us, whoa, what's, yeah, it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and then he goes into the temple. While he's in the temple, Mark says he just looked around, and then at the end of the day, they leave, and they go back to Bethany, and they spend the night in Bethany. That's Sunday. Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, visits the temple, leaves, goes back to Bethany. Monday, they get up early, they return to uh, Jerusalem, and on the way, they see a fig tree. 
Jesus is hungry, no figs on the tree, so he curses it. Then they go into Jerusalem, and they go into the temple where Jesus cleanses the temple. He overturns the tables, and he chases away the merchants and the money changers. Can you guys hear that out there? Okay, cool. Okay. At the end of the day, they leave the temple, they go back to Bethany, and they spend the night there in Bethany. Next morning, Tuesday, they get up and they start their trip back to to Jerusalem. There they go. And they come to the fig tree that Jesus had cursed on the previous day, and they see that it's dead. Okay, so that's Mark's version. He gives us the girl version. Matthew gives us the guy version. Again, he's going to streamline and simplify the story. Matthew has this, the Palm Sunday, starts off the same way, Palm Sunday, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Then they go into the temple. Now, here's where Matthew changes the story. He's going to simplify. So what he does is he takes the temple cleansing, which occurred on Monday, and he moves it to Sunday and he conflates it with the first temple visit and narrates both as a single event. And so Jesus cleanses that temple. (laughs) At the end of the day, they leave, they go back to Bethany, and they spend the night. This is all Palm Sunday still. Monday, they get up early in the morning, and they're headed back to Jerusalem, and Jesus is hungry. They come to the fig tree, no figs. He curses it, and it withers before their very eyes. Matthew has again streamlined the story. He's compressed and conflated two events into one so that he narrates it as though he curses the tree, and it withers on the spot. He simplifies flexibility. Now, I know, I can guess what happened later. Mark came to Matthew and he said, you know, it didn't happen that way, Matt. Jesus only walked into the temple and looked around on Sunday. He didn't cleanse it until Monday, but you took it from Monday and you placed it on Sunday and conflated it with the event and made it as one. And look what you did with the fig tree. You took the fig tree and instead of the two events, you made it one event so that he cursed it and it withers on the spot. Matthew, you have deceived your readers and fictionalized the account. And Matthew turns to Mark and says, come on, man, you remind me of my wife. <laughs> In these two stories, Matthew has simplified, he streamlined by altering some minor details. He moves the temple cleansing from Monday to Sunday, a different day. He conflates two events into one. He compresses events to have occurred over a shorter period of time. And he narrates words spoken by one person as though spoken by another. But Matthew is using compositional devices that were commonly used in ancient biography in that day. In fact, many of those we use today even in our present conversations. Now, if you consult the commentaries uh, by, written by New Testament scholars, even a majority of evangelical New Testament scholars will agree with the solutions that I've just provided or something very close to them. However, a minority of evangelicals take some different approaches. One approach is creative harmonization. For example, they'll say, well, the centurion sent some Jewish elders, then sent some of his friends, and then he decided himself to go to Jesus later on. It's kind of like that old transparency, overhead transparency, and you lay the transparencies on top of one another, and all the details fit together. Problem with that is it is pure speculation, but even worse, it doesn't jive with the biblical texts. Because Luke, not only does it say in Luke's gospel that he sent others on his behalf, but Luke says after Jesus said the servant would be healed, Luke reports when those who had been sent by the centurion returned to the house, they found the servant well. It's those who had been sent who returned to the house. No mention is made of the centurion going because according to Luke, he didn't go. 
Another option is that Matthew made an error. Now, I have yet to find a skeptic, a skeptical scholar who takes that position, but it is found I've did, uh, Lydia McGrew, a Christian apologist, takes this approach. She thinks Matthew actually believed that the centurion himself went, sent no emissaries, and wasn't aware that the centurion had actually stayed and sent the emissaries. So she says Matthew was mistaken. It was an innocent mistake, but it was an error no less. Now when compositional devices that were part and parcel of writing ancient biography in that day, when those easily account for a difference, I see no reason to prefer an error. Moreover, McGrew insists that had Matthew known that the centurion had sent emissaries and did not go, but yet streamlined the story, simplified it by omitting the emissaries and having the centurion himself go, that that would have been to deceive his readers and fictionalize the account. Fictionalize is a term she likes and uses often. But we need not feel captive to McGrew's black and white thinking. It leads to a flat-footed literalism that's out of touch with how people wrote in antiquity, indeed, how many of us communicate even today. Recognizing that the gospel authors used compositional devices allows us to understand why the differences are there. It assists us in avoiding strained harmonizations which may themselves be fictional. And it provides more plausible reasons for the dif differences in the gospels than errors.